um, humanity has uh, divided them uh, itself into uh, various uh, segments based on on various uh, uh, things that uh, we believe to be true um, uh, we have divided ourselves into uh, a lot of things we have divided ourselves into um, race caste uh, religion and all those uh, divisions and and we versus them uh, have uh, has slowly uh, become the the norm over a period of time but uh, we have to ask ourselves uh, about whether we are different so as i was telling we all are the results of simple course of nature that uh, within us uh, with, that is within uh, all of us and and that that code is known as the dna uh, most of us who are non not belonging to the scientific background also know about the dna so watson and crick was the were the first people who drew these codes as as very long threads of of winding winding threads that were strewn with uh, nucleic acids and which codes for proteins and proteins are the ones which makes makes us up it makes our 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 bodies it makes our hair it makes our eyes and and it it it's basically a building block for whatever organic life exists um and we thought that um, things pass down from parent to offspring that and and we we carry them forward so this this are the things that we carry forward uh, and uh, uh, the weird bro of our grandfather and the blue eyes of our grandmother everything uh, tends to be passed uh, down through generations and it was clear to people that uh, over generation uh, we looked similar to our relatives and uh, uh, it, it bound us as a small uh, uh, band of relatives or uh, a clan of blood relations. Uh but uh, again, it, it brought us uh, to this uh, uh, motive that why was the other person in the other town or other village different? He has a darker skin, he has uh, black eyes. Uh, maybe he belongs to a different race altogether. Or he's a different human being. Uh, that is what we thought in those uh, th those dark times. So uh, in in Europe uh, there was a phase called Renaissance when the Enlightenment brought a lot of things into humanity. A lot of new concepts were were established, and these concepts were based on the process of reason. So reason was the thing that the the Renaissance gave us. And uh, before that, all the philosophies in the world uh, they had put a specific timeline as to how uh, humans have come into existence. The Bible tells us that. The Genesis happened around 4000 BC, uh, which is just 6000 years back, and the Great Flood happened around 2300 BC. Uh, the Jewish tra Jewish tradition also follows the same thing. Uh, we in in the Eastern society uh, do not put a specific timeline, but we're very vague on how did it happen. And uh, metaphysics come into play, and uh, we don't uh, specify the time of of the on onset of human life. But uh, the other end, uh, uh, old civilizations like the Mayans were no better as uh, they thought that the destruction of the previous world brought the new world and they put a date of around 3100 BC to that. So these are the da these dates might seem quite ridiculous to us now because we know that it's not that back in time uh, time in the past and it was just a small f period of time. Um, so um, it was a big surprise when people started to dig the ground in those times and they found that uh, the various uh, pieces of stones that were chiseled into different shapes uh, different uh, instruments and different uh, weapons were found out and the degree of finesse uh, of these stones were uh, were found and they were they were uh, deep within the ground that was excavated and these artifacts grew, grew coarser they grew even rougher and rougher as as they kept digging into the past and this phase of human life is known as the paleolithic phase or the stone age as as paleo means stone so people then didn't know that these tools were made made way back in the past much above the timelines that were mentioned in our uh, religious textbooks uh, alongside these stone tools they also found fragments of bones and in some cases uh, even part of the skeleton and whole skeletons were found uh, some of these bones did look human and uh, uh, but there were a lot of oddities they they found out that some of these stones had uh, some of these bones uh, Although they look like humans, their their cranial size was different, their eyes were different, their jaws were different. Uh, so over the period, uh, they were not able to explain this uh, in the absence of the the newer uh, scientific development. So uh, over a period of time, it became just a collector's uh, fancy, and uh, it it was closed in vaults and museums over a long long period of time. This um, this slowly came to an end when when.
in that archipelago um they were uh, they were if you look at the the tortoises some of the tortoises had different snouts they had different types of the carapace that is the the uh, heart of the back and that um, uh, even though they belong to the same species um, they had actually uh, developed in a very different way as they were separated by uh, uh, big water uh, segments of the sea and uh, they had developed in different islands so he was quite um, uh, fancied by this and he uh, did lots of research on them and he finally put his observations forward in a book called the origin of the species and this book uh, it it chronicle all the concepts about evolution the initial concepts and the path through which these species evolve and um, they, they develop into new ones and he explains how uh, nature selects uh, individuals and species based on their ability to survive and uh, those surviving pass on their uh, genetics to the next generation and but at that time he was clueless about um, the concepts of heredity and how heredity actually happened because at that same almost in the same time in Austria uh, an abbot by the name of Gregor Mendel he was studying peas and he had found out that there were specific uh, things that were passed on from one generation to other as he uh, grew uh, generations and generations of peas uh, if both of them had met each other then the the um, concept that Darwin had postulated would not have remained a theory that uh, was uh, written at that time as the evolutionary theory it would have become a fact and this uh, tag of theory has forever stuck to that and people who are non-evolutionary belie believers they usually keep uh, telling that theory is not a fact but uh, it would have become a fact if they would have met each other so again Darwin had to wait for many years before uh, gene as the unit of hereditary was found out and uh, um, scientists worked out how this genetic material is passed down the generation so Richard Dawkins in his book The Selfish Gene has argued how um, these genes are actually the immortal ones and it passes on through the bodies of um, um, individuals and organisms and uh, these organism, organisms and bodies uh, actually function as a survival machine for these genes. So genes are basically immortal and it goes way back to when the gene uh, and the DNA first began. So uh, the Human Genome Project uh, which concluded 10-15 uh, uh, years back had basically mapped all the nucleotides in the human genome. and. Uh, till then it was not possible to do that and now since because of a global effort it was possible and we found out that uh, we had we have around 3 billion base pairs of these nucleotides in in both the uh, chains of uh, of the chromosome and around 1 to 2 of 2 percent of them make up all the genes that that uh, code the various things that make up our, our body and uh, in fact all organic life uh, Ironically, to the uh, as a blow to the anthropogenic theory that we are the only superior uh, organisms, uh, the genes that code for these proteins are basically the same across all organisms that live on Earth, whether it be a single cell bacteria or be a, uh, the, the Gajanchun uh, blue whale that, that is the largest living organism. They all have these four base pairs and they code for proteins that make up whatever size of body in which the genes reside. So it is, it is indeed uh, uh, such a miracle if you think about it and uh, it's such a wonder, wonder to think about it. Um, it will also be a shock to find out that uh, we share around 60% uh, uh, of our genetic material with a banana. So uh, the plants also share the same genetic makeup to a certain extent and chimpanzees are our closest living um, uh, animals. We share around 99% of uh, genes with them. Uh, it is just the remaining 1% of genes that make us different and uh, we, have, we, uh, uh, we have been uh, fooling ourselves by thinking that it is this 1% which makes us superior. It is not like that, it is just that this 1% of, uh, of the gene is the one which makes us a human, uh, not, not a chimpanzee. So now we, as we go back to the, uh, the skeletons, the tools and Darwin, um, uh, once the theory of evolution was uh, being slowly understood and it was able to give explanation to why there were so many species and plants and animals on this on this planet the uh, the idea that humans might have evolved out of primates uh, whose skeletons were turning up all over the place uh, began to gain foothold and uh, uh, darwin argue, argued that under the pressure of nature only the ones which survived had their genes passed on to the offspring so there is no intent in in this passing of genes and the the, the evolution um, the uh, the nature did not um, intend our noses to be of this shape, our fingers to be of this shape. 
it is just that every generation uh, this particular system worked for that generation and it was passed down over and over a uh, period of time and eventually it leads to the uh, varied types of life forms that exist right now uh, so over a period of time as the selection pressure uh, cause small changes in the uh, in the genes and in the morphology so uh, two different individual organisms they got separated to a great degree to form species and once they are of different species scientifically uh, species are the ones which do not which are not able to breed together and produce offspring so they become entirely different uh, organisms and they evolve into different species so in another interesting book by Dawkins the climbing mount improbable uh, he elegantly explains how many of these mountains of evolution were climbed of the various species and as they climbed a mountain they again were not able to survive and they fell down a mountain and slowly again they had to climb another mountain and so on and so forth and in this scheme of things there is no Mount Everest we humans always uh, take this pride in thinking that we have climbed the highest mountain of evolution and we are on the Mount Everest of the evolutionary range but that is not so all species including humans reindeer sharks octopuses and the fig tree and the, the grass uh, they are all living beings that are the top of the mountain that they are currently had uh, the mountain which they have climbed and they are able to fully survive uh, along with all of us humans and if uh, we we remove all the tools of, of modern life and we are left to nature many of these organisms might be able to survive much better in nature than us so we should not be thinking that we have climbed the highest mountain of evolution so um, with the modern uh, age came lots of modern uh, developments we were able to use methods like radiocarbon dating and uh, uh, chemo illuminescence method and dendrochronology so there are a lot of such dating tools and with this, with this dating tools now uh, we can roughly estimate that the universe is around 13.1 billion years old so that is a huge period of time and uh, the life on earth uh, began around 3.7 billion years ago so for organisms like us who uh, have a lifespan of around 40 to 45 years um, so this duration of uh, 3.7 billion is not fathomable to us we are not evolved to understand this huge time of of, of space of time and uh, our, even our memories just go back to a few generations and we don't remember what has happened after a few generations so uh, we have to believe that uh, based on the facts given by modern science life is very 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 old and it does not uh, match with the any references that is given to us uh, by theology and all those things so if you go by science we have to believe that life is really old so with this background um, I shall come to the, the topic of today's uh, main uh, uh, concern that is the human story. So it is said that uh, humans tend to th uh, think in stories rather than facts, numbers and equations and the simpler the story the better. So um, I will try to make this story a little simple because it does have a lot of facts and it does have a lot of numbers but uh, a simpler story would, would, would drive the point home. And with this understanding that uh, life is old and uh, that life is controlled by a few basic molecules which is common across all species and uh, life has evolved with time and time has brought changes and these changes have brought new species uh, we will focus just on the human story so there are a few ways in which um, we study the ancient past and we try to make a sense of the, the basic question that which I had uh, initially put forward that where do we come from so these tools that is used in modern um, uh, understanding are archaeology genetics and linguistics so linguistics is, is an entirely different topic and uh, archaeology is basically unearthing uh, the, the different layers of the earth and digging deeper to find out uh, what had happened millions of years ago as they kept on being deposited and going down the timeline so that is this is known as stratigraphy that means the various straight on the various layers of uh, of earth are being deposited at a, at a particular time and those animals or, or plants which have, have died at that time would have got deposited in those layers as fossils so we go and uh, we go and excavate and we find out uh, various fossils we find out bones we find out uh, civilizations we find out stone tools and uh, and uh, even some of the uh, uh, genetics have derived help from this uh, branch of uh, of, of uh, understanding and um, uh, with this we found out various skeletons that looked like us um, even though they had a lot of uh, differences like the skull size was different so we thought that it must have been an extinct um, group of ape species and uh, that they were not existing and then uh, even even after the understanding all the things we still believe that uh, we suddenly appeared on the scene and uh, we are uh, created on the 
uh, image of someone who is more superior to us. So uh, everything changed after a period of time when genetics started evolving. The, the late 1800s and the, f and the initial 1900s was the time when genetics uh, developed a loop, leaps and bounds and it has changed our understanding about, uh, about all these things, about relationship between species. Uh, and um, how does genetics help? Uh, first, let us understand that uh, we have, we have a, a long sequence of, of DNA and uh, over a period of time, just like uh, the copying of, uh, of, a, of a DVD or a copy of a book, uh, the, the second and third and fourth and the sequential copies of, um, of whatever we are copying uh, leaves behind some sort of impurities or blips and these are known as mutations. So, um, as human beings procreate and they, 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 they transfer their genetic material to the offspring, uh, some amount of, of mutational activities tend to accumulate and uh, we have worked out that uh, the, the rate of accumulation of these mutations is quite constant like a particular mutation appears after so many thousands of years and then another thousands of years second mutation appears. So if we, we have a genetic sequence of two individuals and we place them across uh, each other and compare uh, and we were able to find out the number of mutations that separate both of us and this is known as polymorphism. So, if you are able to find it out and by the Human Genome Project now it is very much uh, possible to map the whole genome. We can find out how far in the evolutionary chain are we related to a particular individual. This is quite uh, fascinating because we can find out uh, uh, our origins and we can find out roughly from which, which place we have uh, begin our, our journey and whether we are uh, related to uh, the, the, the person next door or not. And um, even after these developments um, in genetics, some section of the people still believe that humans are special and uh, that the uh, earlier bones and skeletons, uh, they all belong to ape species who are not in and, and this is the Anthropocene, that is the age of humans of, of believing. and. Uh, um, the, the bones of the first human um, uh, humans that were unearthed by the archaeologists um, were named as Homo sapiens and we were um, quite uh, proud enough to name uh, ourselves as the, the, the thinking hominids, that is the, uh, the species of the uh, Homo genus who thinks uh, as if the other uh, species were not thinking. So that is what we, were, uh, we, we have been believing. So, uh, we have used uh, genetics to, to, to trace uh, how human life began. So, coming back to that story. So, in, our, in each of our cells, we have something known as a mitochondria. Mitochondria is basically small um, powerhouses that lie within the cell that powers the cellular activity. And uh, each mitochondria contains a small piece of DNA, which is, which is not there in the nucleic acid. And uh, this is a known as mitochondrial DNA. Now, what, what scientists have done was that uh, they, they started studying this mitochondrial DNA across people living in different parts of the globe. Uh, the the um, uh, primitive tribes that were living in each area who have not migrated uh, a lot. So, like for example, the aborigines of South Africa, of Australia and uh, the, the uh, aboriginal tribes of Southern India. So, uh, they have taken samples of mitochondrial DNA across all these uh, people living in different parts and with this rate of mutational analysis which I have told about the polymorphisms, uh, we have slowly been able to track it back. Now mitochondrial DNA is interesting because it is only passed to the offspring from the mother because the, the, the mitochondria is passed only in the ovum and the sperm usually does not contribute any to any mitochondria in the, uh, in the embryo. So uh, all the mitochondrial DNA in a human being comes from the mother. So if you are able to trace mitochondrial DNA across uh, different times and we are able to find out that a particular mitochondrial DNA was existing so many thousands of years back. So, uh, that lineage of mothers are the one which through which we have uh, uh, got that mitochondrial DNA and we are the children of that mother. So, uh, they have done uh, assessment of DNA across the planet and they have now traced back all human lineages of people living outside Africa to be from one particular individual who lived in uh, Eastern Africa in Ethiopia uh, dating approximately around 3.2 million years ago. So, uh, that it was not a human species, it was an Australopithecus species and um, somewhat like between an between ape and a human and that particular uh, uh, skeleton through which this genetic analysis took place was uh, named as the mitochondrial Eve interestingly and uh, was nicknamed as Lucy. So, we are all the descendants of Lucy, if you are able to 
if you are scientifically uh, bent and you believe that this science uh, holds true and it belong to one particular type haplotype that is one particular type of the mitochondrial DNA which is known as the L3 haplotype which uh, belong to that particular uh, Australopithecus and through that the whole uh, human humanity outside Africa have have been born. Uh, we know we have this uh, whole skeleton of, the Lu of Lucy in the museum and uh, through the study of bones we find out that uh, this species used to walk erect, had a small brain, uh, lived in trees but did not use tools. So they were they were the uh, species prior to the, the, the hominid. Now they lived in a very lush green forest in eastern Africa. At that time uh, eastern Africa used to be a tropical forest and uh, the rift valley suddenly separated, Clim climates changed, the, the trees died down and we were all forced to live in an open ground in the savannah. So we were forced to come down from the trees and the evolution which I was describing uh, picked up people who were able to survive this harsh environment and slowly and slowly and slowly over millions of years, uh, thousands and millions of years, um, Australopithecus they slowly uh, evolved into the current uh, human uh, group of species known as hominids or homo species, homogeneous. And um, um, uh, hominids initially were uh, not like humans, they, they were a uh, little bit in between the Australopithecus and the, the Homo sapiens and uh, one, uh, one among them is found all across the globe known as the, the Homo erectus that is the straight walking uh, hominid. And, uh, uh, all over the planet, the uh, the uh, Homo erectus uh, skeletons have been found, which means that uh, they had got a lot of time and they had they used to migrate to great distances, but they eventually died out. Uh, and uh, the the currently existing humans, uh, they were all belonging to the next type of ape, which evolved, which is known as the uh, Homo sapiens. The in initial Homo sapiens ab appeared in Africa at around around 200,000 years ago. That is quite some time back and. For thousands of years, they lived in the African uh, uh, plains. Uh, they, they, they were uh, foragers, hunter-gatherers, and they made uh, simple tools, and they gave rise to the Paleolithic, that is a Stone Age period, and they hunted using tools. Um, and after a, a period of thousands of years ago, when the climate started changing, they were forced to look for uh, new grounds, and they were forced to walk about and find out better places. And that forced us to come out of Africa. and. Uh, um, around 70,000 years ago, um, somewhere around 70,000 years ago, um, a band of Homo sapiens, they, they came out of Africa and they settled in the Middle East. So now uh, doing all this genetic analysis and polymorphisms, we, we now know that the entire gene pool belonging to humans narrows down to a period in the past at around 70,000 years ago to just 12,000 Homo sapiens who actually migrated out of Africa and we were the species who were almost extinct at that period in time because of climate change or, or whatever was happening and uh, if this migration would not have happened our species would have actually died out at that time and after that we, we know what has happened we have uh, populated the whole world. Um, how do we know that uh, only this many group of people were living now? Uh, uh, and how we have come out of Africa. So one way was the mitochondrial DNA tracking. Another indirect uh, way comes from the genetic heterogeneity study. Now, if you look at uh, a forest with, with thousands of, of trees and we, we take out a few hundred trees and plant it in some other, some other place and create a forest. Um, and from those, that new forest, if you take another two or three trees and again plant that forest in another place and go so on and so forth, uh, eventually to just take so that variation is quite huge in the initial forest and uh, uh, they did the same thing with, with, with DNA. They compared the uh, genome of people living farther and farther and farther away from, from, from Africa and, and to their utter surprise and to whatever statistical analysis uh, was used, it was found that the genetic heterogeneity increased the closer and closer and closer the, the humans were living uh, to Africa. So this gives a robust um, uh, uh, evidence and backing to the concept that life originated in Africa. Um, the Europeans were quite reluctant in, in believing this for a long time and only after the, the era of modern science that they were forced to believe that even though they might be 
the white and consider themselves much superior to the Africans. Uh, we all have uh, uh, Africans living within us and we all are um, descendants of just 12,000 homo sapiens who were who walked out of Africa. So if you look at the, at the more interesting mathematics, um, we can again um, uh, try to relate each other by doing a simple mathematics as to how many ancestors were uh, responsible for us. So we have two parents, we have four uh, grandparents, we have eight great grandparents. And uh, if you go back and back and back in, in the past, so if, if you go back 100 generations back, so uh, mathematically we should be having around two to, two to the power 100 uh, ancestors and that will come in, uh, in, in billions and if you go back 1000 generations it will be in trillions. Now it is not possible for the earth to have uh, more than uh, uh, trillions of individuals living at one point in time through which we have descended as a single person. So that means that uh, a point at uh, many points in time uh, various groups of people migrated away and then eventually they came back together and they interbred among each other and uh, many of us they, they, they are actually related to each other in this way. So a uh, person standing next to you might be a distant cousin to you by a hundred generations or maybe a thousand generations. If you take the human uh, origin to be around 200,000 years ago, so we are probably the 7,000th or the 8,000th uh, generation of humans we are living. And if we if we take this to the power of 2 to the power this amount, this is quite impossible. So uh, even if you look at logically, so uh, we have lots and lots of relatives living within each other which we do not know because uh, once we migrate out from a place, our, our uh, idea about uh, time and, and generations do not last beyond a few generations. So we do interbreed and we have been um, interbreeding with each other over a period of time and we have been settling in different places in that way. So this gives uh, a strange feeling that um, we are probably, all of us are related uh, quite closely. So even at that time we were still thinking that we were suddenly put in, put on the planet by some outside force or some um, supernatural being. Um, this kind of change once uh, a very different type of skull was found in Germany in the Neander cave, caves and that, that um, hominid species came to be known as uh, the Neanderthals. We probably uh, know in common um, knowledge about the Neanderthal man. So um, Neanderthals were supposed to be uh, a, a human living in, in, in Europe uh, and Eurasia and uh, uh, they looked uh, quite similar to us but were different in, in the their looks, in their stocky build, their uh, skull was different, their brows were huge and the bones, uh, it was not just one skull what that was found, hundreds of skulls were found and the evidence was irrefutable that this was a different uh, hominid species. And in 2009, um, uh, Savan Pabu, a scientist, uh, ge a geneticist uh, in Leipzig, um, he was able to develop um, uh, techniques to sequence the entire Neanderthal gene genome just like the human genome and uh, he was able he was the first person to to be able to place the Neanderthal genome just next to the human genome and it was found out that we had we, we had a huge similarity and um, uh, the modern people Well, uh, if we had bred with each other, interbred with each other, so we cannot consider Neanderthals to be of a different species also. So that they were entirely different humans. So uh, all the concept of uh, humans being um, just humans uh, falls flat on the face. And uh, it was furthered by another finger bone that was found in Siberia in the Denisova Caves in 2013 that was uh, known as, uh, again that was sequenced and to the utter surprise of scientists, it was found to be an entirely different hominid species. Uh, not not exactly species, entire hominid uh, group of of apes, and uh, they named them as Denisovans. So, uh, a lot of people living in Southeast Asia, especially in New Papua Guinea, uh, they carry around two to four percent of the Denisovan gene as well. And it is uh, it is also postulated that Tibetans who live in high altitudes are able to live in high altitudes because they have carried forward that. A uh, particular gene that prevents them from the effects of low oxygen, and these genes were found in the the the, the genetic uh, analysis of the Denisovans. 
So they are all the, uh, the genes that were carried forward from the Denisovans and, and selected as per the uh, survival that advantage that it gave to each individuals. So it is entirely possible that lots and lots of other archaic, uh, archaic means uh, prehistoric uh, hominid species have lived along with us and slowly they all got extinct and uh, they contributed to our uh, uh, survival by passing on uh, their genes, good genes to us and uh, we, we eventually, uh, they, they eventually uh, died out whether it's because of our efforts or whether they were not able to survive the, the climate change, we do not know. And so um, around 20 to 30,000 years back, we were probably the only hominid species left on the planet. So things were going peacefully till then. We were uh, hunter-gatherers, we were foragers, so we were uh, living in groups of 20 to 30s and going around peacefully, uh, fetching um, berries and uh, having some hunts and uh, living a peaceful life among closely related groups of, of similarly similar genetic groups. And once we met some other groups, we must have interbred as shown by the uh, interbreeding between uh, different looking um, hominid in the Neanderthals and Denisovans. Uh, we must not have been that uh, um, uh, we must not have disliked each other that much otherwise we would have died down at that time because there were very less humans living across the planet but uh, every all the all the hell broke broke loose uh, when the holocene epoch started the holocene epoch is the the warm phase uh, in which we are living right now and it began somewhere around uh, 10000 to 20000 years back when the the earth uh, became uh, warm the ice uh, mel started melting uh, the sea levels started rising and the various continents got separated with the sea and uh, because of plenty of water flowing in the rivers the uh, there were lots of places all across the globe that became uh, full of life especially the um, uh, place which is uh, between the tigris and the euphrates uh, which is also known as the fertile crescent and at, in, it is in that place that uh, people first discovered the art of agriculture by be, being able to domesticate plants and domesticating animals and once they found out that they could domesticate plants and animals, they could, were able to live in a single place and could give away with their hunter-gatherer sort of lifestyle. And um, yeah, things were going great till then because uh, the nature gave them plenty. They were able to produce a lot of, lot of offsprings and, and they were able to pass more and more genetic material by creating more babies. And the human society uh, population suddenly exploded. But um, the, the thing that went wrong at that time was that we started uh, building walls so that was a that was the main point in time uh, in in human life when we actually built walls to delineate that this much is ours so this is the basic philosophy with which uh, i had designed this talk that uh, if it was not for building the walls maybe things would have been different but uh, we started building walls and uh, were not directly related to us genetically but there were people from different backgrounds coming and living together so uh, the 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 ability to survive in such a mess was only possible if we uh, started dividing ourselves into different groups and and bands and different ideologies and different religions and uh, because of this uh, the the and the communication which we had because of the development of language uh, we were able to rule this entire planet and uh, slowly now we have ballooned to more than 7,000 humans living across the planet and we are responsible for the extinction of, of hundreds and thousands of species over the past 2,000-3,000 years. So, um, cutting the long story short, um, to, to look at the uh, human history, we all have come from Africa with an irrefutable scientific and archaeological evidence. A small group of us migrated out of Africa around 70,000 years ago. Few of us went into Europe came back again went back into Europe that happened around 40 50 thousand years back similarly another group migrated along the coast towards South India where we have probably reached around 60 70 thousand years back some of them have crossed the seas and then were able to have boats and they migrated to Africa around 50 thousand years another group they crossed the the land crossing between Siberia and Alaska which was uh, full of ice during the ice age they walked through into Af America sometimes around 20 thousand years back and once the ice melted, that land was cut off and this group of people, they slowly migrated down from North America to South America and eventually ended up populating the whole of uh, Americas by 12,000 years. So this is how humans have, have migrated over a period of time. We have enough genetic material to, to back this evidence and we have to believe that this is the truth. Uh, till somebody else comes and, and refutes uh, as, as happens in science.
so i hope um um people who are listening to me are are still uh, uh, awake and this not, not has not put them into deep slumber so i would like to end today's uh, talk by which i have gathered by studying these things have realized that number one is that uh, we all are, are related uh, regardless of our color regardless of our uh, language regardless of wherever uh, on the earth we are living we are all uh, all related to each other and and that relation goes back to thousands of years and we are just a relation of a few thousand years uh, of individuals who have actually been able to survive and have populated the earth so uh, Uh, we have to have this uh, uh, we have to take this as a humility and um, uh, we have to understand that um, uh, whatever we think about the other person uh, in terms of whatever they believe um, uh, deep down within all of us we are the same and uh, uh, it it should uh, give a lot of uh, it should uh, put in a, a, a sort of a, a humility amongst amongst all of us and um, we should also stop believing that um, Uh, we were put here to harness nature and the earth and um, that um, everything is meant for us because it is not like that we are actually animals who have uh, evolved over a period of millions of years and have evolved to to survive on this planet and uh, uh, we should not be uh, ransacking around and and destroying whatever we have uh, around us and we have to believe that just like climbing the mount improbable uh, the down slope will begin and uh, scientists have termed this current era which we are living in it as the sixth extinction as per the uh, five uh, massive extinction event that happened in the past so with this um, i will uh, end today's talk and uh, uh, if uh, people are interested they can they can uh, put some comments and uh, um, yeah we can uh, we can discuss about it okay i i see an interesting <laughs> comment here uh, about who i am so uh, i think uh, the introduction was not given in the video so i am basically uh, vishal gore i am a nephrologist um, that is a kidney specialist i practice in siliguri and um, i have uh, done my uh, uh, studies and schooling all over all over the country and uh, i am practicing in siliguri for the last 13 years and uh, i guess i am man of science so that's a whatever i've talked about has a lot of science behind it so i i guess that should answer okay so dr khilanath sharma who is a renowned uh, doctor poet um he has uh, asked this question as um, uh, whether uh, it's believed that the conscience that separates uh, the homo sapiens from the rest of the species do you think that consciousness is a sudden phenomenon to occur for homo sapiens what what role does uh, genetic uh, play in this regard uh, now this this question has um, Uh, yeah, probably a lot of uh, theologians and a lot of uh, scientists are not able to still answer this question regarding the 
the advent of, of consciousness. But um, uh, consciousness actually began as the ability of humans to be able to to understand the, the, the environment in which uh, they were living in at that point in time and um, it, it, it evolved as a sudden uh, short-term reactions to the environmental um, um, stimuli that was present at that time uh, in order to uh, save humans from uh, either being eaten up or to find the prey uh, that was lurking just beside them. Um, slowly and slowly um, it, it evolved and uh, uh, with time it became more and more complex because it, it helped us in surviving uh, nature because uh, having uh, a, a, a sort of a, um, unreal uh, experience um, helped us make a lot of stories. So uh, stories are another, the, the other myth which has uh, helped human build a society on, on top of it and, and these myths and stories uh, slowly crept into uh, uh, forming religion also. And uh, uh, us being aware of our environment is the, the extreme form in which evolution has probably taken this uh, simple way of uh, reacting and understanding with the environment. So that is probably the only uh, way we can answer um, conscience scientifically. So uh, lots of studies are still going on. We really don't know how consciousness has evolved, but uh, probably that is the, the best answer that we could uh, probably get at, at this point. I am not getting many questions, so I believe that either the topic must have been quite boring or um, maybe I made it too simple for everybody <laughs> to understand. Uh, I have intentionally skipped a lot, a lot of things um, because that would make the video too long and uh, we would be stuck only in the facts and the uh, details of, of what was going around. So uh, another question from Egam Khaling. Um, could you kindly tell us some positive sides of, of genetic engineering? So yes, um, uh, genetics has paved way for a lot of developments and uh, uh, medicine is probably the, the, the field where um, genetics has helped uh, uh, to understand diseases a, a great lot. Uh, like for example in the field of, of oncology that is cancer research. Um, nowadays we, uh, we have found out the genes responsible for almost many of the of the cancers that human beings face and if you know the genes which cause these cancers we are able to uh, develop drugs that go and act specifically on particular target and that is known as the targeted therapy um, so that is the uh, the science behind uh, genetics in in uh, medicine now if you go to genetic engineering it's a, it's a very um, uh, shaky ground because um, uh, the recently um, a Nobel Prize has been awarded for a technique known as the CRISPR technology in which we were able to uh, in, in, in the embryo, in the uh, un unborn child in the form of a small uh, clump of cells lying in the mother's womb, we are able to take out the cells. Uh, we were able to identify which particular uh, sequence of, of gene causes a particular disease or is responsible for a particular trait. We were able, we, could, we, we, we can now cut that sequence and then put in a different sequence which has uh, better benefits. So this CRISPR technology is, is uh, been seen, is being hailed as the new um, uh, holy grail in science because uh, if we are able to use it in a positive way, then we, we will be probably able to eliminate a lot of uh, diseases that uh, still haunt us in the form of uh, malignancies, in the form of genetic disorders. But again, the other flip side is that it could be used in in creating uh, something better than us. Uh, human may have this capacity of thinking about creating superhumans or uh, uh, Homo Deus as uh, Yuval Noah Harari has uh, pointed out. So uh, if we are not able to use this technology responsibly then it has its flip side as well. But yes, uh, it, it does help in, uh, in, in treatment and um, probably that is the place where we should um, keep it right now. So another question asks is Neanderthals were found to have a larger brain size than us despite that they were not able to survive past ice age. Was, what must have differentiated us to have surpassed all sorts of extremes in terms of survival? Yes, it is true. So all the uh, 
uh, excavations and all the analysis showed that the uh, the neanderthal skull skull was bigger than that of humans so uh, they probably had a bigger brain but their brain was predominantly focused in on the back side of the uh, skull which is known as the occiput so this is mainly responsible for uh, vision so um, it, it can be postulated that um, neanderthals had, had extremely good visions we had because they had to live in very high uh, parts in the the arctic where light was quite uh, dull so a huge part of the brain where was concentrated mainly on um, um, on sight but uh, we humans have a, have a larger forehead so this part of the brain is known as the uh, frontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex which we know and prefrontal cortex is the one which gives abstract thinking and uh, gives us emotions is able to uh, help us to communicate with another human being and a lot of evolutionary changes that that is the 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 development of a flat brow which in which we can play various emotions came into evolution the the eyes also had this whites around the black which uh, the other person could sense whether the uh, the person in front of them was uh, displaying some emotions we are the only primates who are able to flush so all these things if you look at uh, at it the human society is entirely dependent on communication being able to communicate and the second development which happened with humans was the development of language so um, once the neanderthals and human genomes were sequenced they found out that a, a specific gene known as the foxp2 gene so it's known as that gene so uh, that gene is, is special in humans because that that is the gene which is responsible for development of language even though neanderthals had a had a, had a larynx had a whole apparatus for producing language they were they were probably not able to communicate as efficiently as we humans could do and maybe that is the reason why uh, humans were able to live in harsh climates they were able to pass down stories to next generation they were able to uh, hand on their uh, skills acquired in the lifetime to the next generation and the learning curve became shorter and shorter for the next generation and that is why probably humans uh, were superior to the neanderthals or maybe uh, they were able to survive better than the neanderthals so i think that is the reason why uh, we are still surviving so my friend deepak rasaili has asked me whether we can change inherited characters in in human beings yes um, if we if we um, uh, if we go and uh, see the science available and uh, although it might sound uh, a little bit of uh, science fiction type uh, if the crispr technology is allowed to um, go on uh, unchecked and if the the genetic manipulations is allowed and uh, ethical uh, ethically no one uh, uh, gives any um, hindrance to this sort of research then it is possible that we could create uh, uh, better humans by, by by changing sequences of dna which is responsible for maybe intellect maybe responsible for uh, genes responsible for vision we can give them a better a genes with better vision and and change it uh, in the the offspring itself so that is quite possible but that is an that is a place which i think we should not go to that is why there is ethics and that is why a lot of such research are are put under lot of ethical ethical bars so that we do not venture into those those areas